in Nairobi, we are the people who help link all of the three to four million Kenyans who are abroad to Nairobi, okay? We're the ones who make sure or who facilitate that they are getting government uh, services wherever they are. She's charged with promoting dialogue with Kenyans living in the diaspora, championing their welfare and their rights, encouraging remittances to their homeland Kenya at the same time, harnessing their savings and investments, as well as mainstreaming their agenda into the national development processes. Today, we hung out with Rosalind Jogu, the Kenyan Principal Secretary for Diaspora Affairs, to discuss not only her role in dealing with Kenyans abroad, but also get to know her story. I, Rosalind Kazure Njogu, being called on to exercise the functions of Principal Secretary. Rosalind Kathure Njogu made history on the 22nd of December when she was appointed Kenya's first ever Principal Secretary for Diaspora Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs. For all of you diasporans, um, looking forward to working with you and supporting you. I'm very grateful for this appointment. She is tasked with prompting dialogue with Kenyans living abroad, championing their rights and welfare, boosting diaspora remittances, encouraging savings, and facilitating foreign direct investment. The State Department has been created out of a great need to support Kenyans living away from home, um, to keep them in dialogue with, uh, with those at home. Born in 1984 in Kitale, located in the western part of Kenya, Rosalind grew up as the youngest of her five siblings. Her mother was a teacher and her father worked for the Kenya prison service and this saw them move from one town to another. Before her appointment, Rosalind was a lecturer at Riara University Law School and Kenyatta University. She holds a Master's of Laws degree from Harvard Law School and a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Nairobi, where she is also pursuing her PhD. She is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya with over 14 years of legal experience advising corporations in technology, health, energy, financial services and international development into the ministry. She was the co-founder and partner in charge of the commercial law practice at LexLink Consulting. It is for these reasons that she makes it to Globe Traction with Persil Talewa. Who is Rosalind Jogu? Let's find out. Hello and welcome to Globe Traction. My name is Persil Talewa. Welcome to the show. Thank and you very much. thanks for creating time for us. Thank you very yeah. much. It's my pleasure. You know you're the first PS to hold that specific office? It's, a, it's an honor, as I said. It's a real honor, it's a pleasure. It's also the responsibility on my shoulders is quite heavy. You have to do the work of institution building. You have to think about what that state department should look like in another 60 years, 100 years, in an extremely globalizing, uh, increasingly globalizing world. Um, and ask yourself, what does uh, a diaspora facing, a diaspora centric uh, State Department look like? How does a government begin to embrace people who are traditionally not within its borders and begin to serve them? So, so it's the hard work of building the startup now, but it's also the hard work of seeing what 100 years from today looks like. Have you been working with government before? How has no. been your career? <laughs> no, not Just really. Just give me an overview. So I'm a lawyer yeah. uh, by profession. I have been practicing commercial law, but I've also been an academic for uh, the last 14 or so years. So I, uh, I teach law. This is my passion. This is what I have done for a long time. I have taught and practiced law. I'm a women's rights activist, women's rights scholar. So I have been writing and researching and teaching these things. How did you grow up? Where did you grow up? Before oh. we get to where did you go to school to? I grew up around the country. So I am a, a very, um, 
what do you call it when multicultural is that is that a word that one can use to describe one person but I, I grew up around the country my parents were civil servants my dad worked for the prison service so between being born in uh, Kitale and living in Nairobi as an adult I have lived in about nine counties in this country so spent a lot of time with my family moving around um, thank you moving around a lot um, so lived in you know some places like uh, Garissa and places like uh, Rumruti um, but also some sort of lush places like Nyeri and, and Meru and so on. I grew up uh, in a I guess what would be called today a large family. There is five of us, yeah. five kids. Yeah. Uh, loved being, have loved being a, a part of a large family. Um, and the last one of five. Oh, look at you! Look at you! <laughs> so I'm speaking yes. to the last one. Uh -huh. Yes, I am aware of all the memes that we have about uh, last one, mm -hmm. and I approve. You approve. I'm glad you tell me which ones apply for you. I, I, I approve. I mean, you know, I mean, so, so when you look at some of these memes, yeah. really, you're, you're blown away by Kenyan's sort of um, How creative creativity, they are. right? So, you know, there's the one for, um, uh, they have a picture of a monkey dying, right? And they say something like that, the last one, a membro of right? Yeah, so so I, I, I love those. Mm -hmm. um, the first part of my life, I went to school in Meru. Uh, where my family is, for, is from, um, and that's from you know uh, primary, lower primary school and boarding school from from age of nine, from grade five. I I, I look back to my childhood with uh, a lot of glee. It was uh, interesting. I did grow up, as I said, around the country, and a big part of my upbringing was um, was in the country. So the usual things of going hunting with dogs with the other children, and with my brothers and sisters, um, fetching firewood. Oh, Do you know the whole thing? Fire. <laughs> <laughs> what does a firewood girl no. look like? Anyway, so there is that, that part of my life which is fun. Um, and just living out there, uh, herding uh, cattle, those are things I've done. Um, so, you know, um, that, was, that, was, uh, that was a fun, very rich part of, of life. I did eventually go, um, and I think we need to pause for this, I went to Alliance. Yes, <laughs> yes another meme. So, so, that, I know. so that, that means uh, you are pretty good. Yes, which, um, which yeah, which I'm so proud and happy to talk about. You're pretty good because you know Alliance didn't accept anybody. Yes, you know, those years. Yes, so yeah. I, I am. Uh, my, my children watch a cartoon called Peppa, Peppa Pig, um, and the smart kids in Peppa Pig are called the clever, clever clogs. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit of a clever clogs. I, <laughs> I did very well um, at primary school level. Um, uh, so I went to Alliance. I think there were, I think two. Also, girls from uh, Meru who went to Alliance in that year, so I went to Alliance, um, and quickly realized that uh, you're the smartest kid in the room until you're in a room of the smartest kids in the room. Yes. Uh, a bit of adjusting, right, and a bit of uh, <laughs> a bit of heat, but. I loved my time at Alliance. Let's yeah. talk about now getting done with Alliance and I've heard that you are at Harvard. Yes. Harvard girls. <laughs> I've met a lot of Harvard girls uh -huh. and it's engineering mm. and it's whatever and it's mm. whatever. I'm so glad to meet somebody who has done, you know, what you've done mm -hmm. and who is in this space that mm -hmm. you are. Tell me how was Harvard? So, um, and how did you get selected <laughs> to be there? So after high school, I went to the University of Nairobi. Uh, the University of Nairobi, yes. as you like the University. Yes. Um, I, I, I had done very well at at, uh, at high school. I had all A's. Um, my name was the newspaper. It was a whole deal. Um, then I went to law school. Had the time of my life at the University of Nairobi Law School. I had this yearning to go and study abroad and so on, and I hadn't managed to do that at undergrad. But by the end of my undergrad, I was like, I think it's time to go and do this now. So I made a list of schools I was going to that apply to, 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 and yes. I, I had done a list. I had Harvard, I had Yale, I had Stanford, I had Columbia. So I had basically, you know, the biggest schools in the Ivy. And at the time when I had to uh, do my 
uh, applications, really I had application fees for one school, right? Because I think at the time it was like $80 or $70 or something. And that was school. still a lot. That's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I was a student on help, you know, <laughs> there is life to live. Yeah. And so at the very last minute, um, my brother gave me $80 and I applied. Um, and I had one shot and I applied to Harvard and I was like, oh my goodness. I hope it goes through. I hope it goes through. And also, I think I'm an idiot for applying to one only. But so I did. And um, by the time the offer came through, I was working at Anjawala and Kanaz, you know, a pupil at, at, the, at, the, at the law firm. Um, and, you know, it was a, a great so wait. Date. Yeah. Rosalind, did you yes. apply to Harvard when you were done with your undergrad or you applied while you're still doing your undergrad? Towards the end, okay. I applied okay. um, because I think you apply, I want to say November, December, right? Um, and then you only find out uh, March, April, May. Mm -hmm. How old are you? You seem pretty young. <laughs> You wait until I have food in my mouth to no. drop to drop the how old are you question. Um, no. I'm 38. Mm -hmm. um, Still young. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I guess I'd like to think so. Still young. <laughs> um, probably. Yes, I am 38. How has it been working for the government of Kenya? I think everybody has asked me, how is it going? Um... How are you finding it? It's been the adventure of my life. Really? I, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think am you're having, one of the few people that I've I told you that. I am having the time of my life. I am having the time of my life. It is fun every day. It is hard work. It is hard. It, it is, is some of the hardest work I've ever done. I, I am that. I am loving my team. I have currently a team of about thirty five or so, and you know, um, uh, looking to grow to about hundred and thirty in the next uh, few months. Within the Ministry of what is called Foreign Affairs, Foreign Affairs yeah. I had a diaspora and consular services directorate. So that directorate is what we are now giving legs and building up to become the State Department. So the entire team that was at the directorate so we look forward to have it something like uh, foreign affairs and uh, consular services. Uh, so the ministry, ministry. Is now, no. So the ministry is now called uh, Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs. Yes, there are two state departments: foreign affairs and diaspora affairs. Mm -hmm. So diaspora affairs so is the little. Up? It is broken up. Okay. It is broken up, and we. Have, it is broken up in the sense of two state departments, but within the ministry, right? So one big family. Uh, Two children, so we are the last born. We're the younger uh, mm -hmm. sister. So you're still developing. Yeah. So we are growing up, building up systems, uh, clarifying what our mandate. The mandate is very clear. The mandate comes from um, the executive order, um, and so that's very clear. But what so we've been what, set what up is to your do. role in that particular office? As principal secretary, you are the accounting officer. You are uh, the authorized officer. You are the lead for that state department. So think of it as a, I guess, pr private, um, uh, in private sector, you're the CEO. So it's of, more of the administration. So yes and no, yeah. it's yeah. administration. So PSs do a lot of administrative work, but also we are the ones who cascade government policy to the ministry Down, level. Yes. So what is, what is government trying to do with its diaspora? It's six things. It's for me to internalize the six things that government is trying to do, create those into programs, all right? Structure those in departments, come up with a strategic plan with my team, and then deploy and run, 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 run. So that if we are not feeling the work that diaspora uh, state department does, then the buck stops with me, right? But I'm also the person uh, in charge of running the budget. For the state department right so that's what accounting office yes. largely means mm -hmm. i'm in charge of the team in the sense of uh, making sure that they are motivated people are getting their promotions um if there's disciplinary action to be taken so you run think of it as a private company and 
PS is the CEO. The Middle East, where mm -hmm. we have cries mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people complaining every other time that mm -hmm. there are so many other girls mm -hmm. are those rescue centers that need assistance and mm -hmm. help, mm -hmm. and they never get it. Has GOK gotten to them? Yes, we have. Them? I was in Riyadh uh, two, three weeks ago. Um, and part of what I did when I was there uh, with the Ministry of Labor and so on is to go to some of these uh, centers, including you know one called Sakan uh, yes, Holding Sakan, Center, yes. which uh, gets a bad rap because people assume that it's a deportation center, which it is not. It's actually a shelter for women, for the domestic workers who are, are in trouble, where domestic workers who come there can get food, can get shelter for free, can get legal aid, um, and eventually tickets to get home. They do a lot of good work. So if someone is in Sakan, that person is actually quite fine. All right. So we went and um, on a fact-finding mission, but also to meet with some of uh, the members of our diaspora there, and to meet with, of course, my, my embassy officials, um, uh, government officials from, um, uh, from Saudi Arabia, and just to establish what is going on. We have, it's a, it's a more complicated situation yeah, and, than you and hear. You just, than you got hear. Me, just got me thinking because you hear. But what I dance. need to say is this, that um, one of the places where we have a lot of vulnerability is when a housekeeper who is, the way the Saudi system works is that I give you a visa that is tied to working in my house, for example, right? You cannot uh, leave that contract and work in his house. You immediately fall out of status. But a number of housekeepers quit this employer who is the sponsor for your visa and attempt to get employment elsewhere. And when that happens, you immediately fall out of status. And when you fall out of status, a number of vulnerabilities immediately attach. For example, medical care is tied to your being in status. So is that the reason why these employers, you know, mm -hmm. get hold of their travel documents mm -hmm. so that they cannot So it's know, illegal go. even in Saudi. And, and I want to be understood when I say that when somebody has fallen out of status, mm -hmm. then they enter the black market. And, and then you begin to get, you know, employment in a second and a third and a fourth house. Okay? And you make some money probably. But when you're out of status, it's very difficult for the law to see you. It's very difficult for us at home to know where you are as a ministry or as the embassy to know where you are for us to extend you help. So this is happening a lot. And sometimes the people who entice housekeepers to leave their contract and go work elsewhere is unfortunately other Kenyans who are already there. And they say, this job is only paying you 30,000 shillings. Come, I'll show you how to make a little more. And so they fall out of status. Some of these uh, young women do not know that this is not something you can do and remain in status. Okay? So, and when that happens, then the vulnerability begins because which employer are you tied to? How do we find them if they are unkind to you, if they are mean to you, if you're in an abused situation? You can't access medical care when you're in that situation. Um, and so after you've been out of status for a while and life has become difficult, then we start to see videos coming up on TikTok, uh, shared on social media. I get tagged on videos on a daily basis of, you know, so and so and so and so and so and so, so, and so needs help. But what we do at the embassy and here in the ministry is every case that comes to us, we follow up. We've given an email address where anybody who is in distress can reach us. We have shared information, and we will share again, and I'll share it with you here, where um, anybody who is in Saudi, for example, who is in distress, there's a number that can be called, okay? For the Saudi government, it's 19911. They say they call that number, nobody picks up. They say they no, call the that one number, nine, I've even been to the call center. Yeah. The 19911 is a Saudi-run um, call center, which if you call and report I'm being abused, by Mwajiri Wangu or something has gone wrong, they investigate and they send cops. And we tried that system when we went to Riyadh. Okay. We have a Kenyan number okay, to the embassy. And this is the one I know there have been complaints that it is not being picked up and so on. We've been working on that. But we also have a number here in Kenya that you can call. And at the moment, we're working to set up a 24-hour call center that will be based here. 
here at the State Department of Diaspora Affairs, where anybody, any diasporian anywhere can call any time, day or night, and we'll get assistance. So that's coming up soon. Um, and I think that's going to begin to alleviate a lot of those concerns. But I think a big part of this also is that we have to do better training, better education, so that you know you're not out of options. I, I if was you about end to up, tell you so. Yeah, if you end up in an abusive situation, for example, you're not out of options. I have been told, for example, hataki uh, kutoka kwa sababu ameshikiwa passport, which is illegal, by the way, even yeah, in Saudi People should not hold your passport. But even if someone keeps your passport and you live without your documents, the embassy processes for you emergency travel documents. We do several every day, okay? So you should not feel like I have to stay in an unsafe place because what am I going to do without my passport? The embassy is going to basically do some, ask you some questions, investigate, confirm are you actually who you say you are. And our system is very good. We're able to immediately tell even where, who your mother is and where they are. So right. tell me, are there any policies that have been formulated? Because I understand there's the policy that was done in, was it 2014 and 2015, mm -hmm. diaspora policy? Mm -hmm. I tend to believe it's quite outdated. I wouldn't in terms say outdated. Of, is mm -hmm. it really helping? Because mm -hmm. we need to look into the welfare of any mm -hmm. Kenyan living mm -hmm. abroad and mm -hmm. see how other states protect their citizens. Absolutely. Yeah. So, And that's a good question. So a number of policies are actually at play here. So there's a diaspora policy of 2014, which is currently under review. Yeah. Um, again, it's been almost, you know, almost 10 years. So a number of things have changed. Trends are different. We're having new sort of challenges, particularly migrant workers. We're talking now about supporting investments and so on. So, so it's currently under review. But specifically for migrant workers, uh, there is a policy as championed by the Ministry of Labor, who's the line ministry really yeah. that deals with all kinds of labor, whether domestic or, um, or uh, global labor. Mm -hmm. um, and that policy is also, is also in place. So there are a number of policies. Um, but you know, policy is important. The policy is as good as its implementation. True. So, the fact that we now have a state department that is purely whose entire job is to look at diasporians at whatever level and run interventions for them should give us a lot of hope and should should give us all a lot of um, a sense of um, something is being done right and we can expect something to be done so and we are doing that as I was saying I think we got stuck at the third point of my mind <laughs> because that's where everything it's critical is at. and i get that and it's yeah. critical and without fixing that welfare and rights foundation you can't do any of the others so which is why for us also just fixing that pillar for rights and welfare is critical because when we fix that then you're able to build on it the dialogue that i talked about the involvement in national development processes um, the uh, diaspora investments and savings, uh, international jobs. So a big part of our mandate is to help Kenyans find international opportunities. That's jobs, that's scholarships, mm -hmm. that's helping diasporians who have businesses abroad thrive. Okay, that's where we're able to, then we can, only at that point when we have savings, we have jobs, we have rights and so on, can we then begin to talk about the sixth thing, which is remittances. And if you fix these other five things, you never even need to talk about remittances. Sure. As they say, Zinajileta to. Right? You fix these five things and then this is it's almost a foregone conclusion. So it's a it's a big mandate. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very yeah. much. It's and my you pleasure. Can now enjoy your meal. No <laughs> Thank, more you talking. Thank you very I'll much. Try I appreciate to keep it. the table minus. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Asante Sana. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure you join us again next Saturday at 8.30 p.m. Kenyan time only on KTN News as we bring you more global stories on our show. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, please write to us through Globetraction at standardmedia.co.ke or DM us on our social media platforms at Globetraction or at KTN News KE. You can also give me a follow on my social media platforms at Pasil Telewa on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube for more of behind the scenes. But until then, I hope to catch up with you again soon. Bye bye for now.